But in the UK, we've been returning to some level of normality this week as shops and uh, hospitality places have been opening up for business again after a long lockdown. People have been talking about the new normal for many months now. Will we ever get back to what we previously considered to be a normal life? Or has everything changed because of the pandemic? Well, time will tell, I suppose, I suppose. But we've certainly got to get used to some adjustments in our lifestyle for the next few weeks and months, and quite possibly for longer than that. It's going to take quite an adjustment, isn't it? It's been a complete transformation of our outlook and way of life, of being limited in what we can do. And this week, I want us to think about being ready for the new normal as we find it in the Bible. And we're going to think particularly about Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus. And his whole life had already been turned upside down by meeting Jesus and following him during his public ministry over three years. And yet because of that incident where he famously denies even knowing Jesus, when he was under pressure, he vehemently swore that he had never even met Jesus. What shame filled his life and how Jesus comes to him in his resurrected appearance and and meets with the other disciples in Galilee and gently uh, and lovingly restores Peter so that he might be useful. Telling him that the new normal will be that he will face many challenges without Jesus there to help him through it. And he must have enduring faith. He must trust the promises that Jesus has given to endure to the end. We're going to think about that from John's Gospel and chapter 21 and Karen's going to read that for us now. John chapter 21. After these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out immediately, got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he'd removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, one hundred and fifty-three, and although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. 
But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then the saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which, if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. So to help us think through this passage, we've got three headings, each beginning with P to help our memory. Firstly, we're going to see Jesus provides. The disciples returned to Galilee. The angels brought that message that they were to do that and Jesus would meet them. So I don't think it's for us to rebuke them for going back to Galilee uh, or even to rebuke them for their fishing trip. It was perfectly natural for them to want to provide food for themselves and their family, perhaps even to look at an income. Perhaps there was an, even an element of therapy, doing something familiar after all the uncertainty and trauma of those past few weeks where they'd witnessed Jesus being crucified and treated so shamefully where they had deserted him and yet he had come back to life and appeared and commissioned them for this new role of, as his messengers. So there's something comforting in the familiar, yet for all their skill, all of their hard work, it was a futile fishing trip. But then there's the stranger on the shore asking them if they got any fish having to admit that no, they hadn't. And we read the story, didn't we? Familiar to us, getting us, in a sense, back to basics where Jesus met those fishermen for the first time there in Galilee and performed that miraculous catch of fish. Then he repeats that now. But this huge catch of fish, 153, they, they counted them up, lots of large fish. And Jesus invites them to share breakfast with him on the beach. He meets their needs, he provides for them and seeks their fellowship. In spite of all of their desertion, all of the distraction that they had allowed into their lives perhaps, he wants them to know that he is risen and he will be the one who will continue to provide for their every need. It's only just beginning to learn the extent of, of his abundant giving, his abundant power. There'll be many tasks ahead for them where they will need his provision and he won't be there to give it, but he will still give, even without his physical presence. They've been casting the net over the side of the boat time and time again, in their own strength, without any result. But now Jesus commands them to cast the net of the kingdom far and wide as they preach the gospel. And to be assured that under his authority and with his power, many will be gathered. An awesome number an unimaginable number will be gathered and they will all be safely contained the net will not be broken so they need not fret that they're going to turn their back and, and one will escape or because of their lack of attention or because of their poor methods their, their poor equipment if you like they can have confidence to be laborers in this great harvest that jesus is bringing in they are doing the master's business and they will know it is the Lord that they're doing it for. Perhaps we need to be reminded of that when times are hard, when it seems that ministry can be fruitful, when the task that Jesus gives us to make him known yields nothing. It's the Lord's work. He will provide. And sometimes he will bring us to a time of futility in, in ministry, futility in service so that we know that it's him that supplies our every need, empties us of our own self-confidence, so that we may depend upon him. But then secondly, we see Jesus 
probing. Jesus probes as he restores Peter. We know from other gospel accounts that Peter had already seen the Lord and with the other disciples. And presumably that was a time filled with tears of, of repentance uh, to, to Jesus and assurance from Jesus. And yet surely that knowledge of his denial must have weighed heavily upon Peter. And Jesus now comes to deal with that uh, very clearly and in a public setting. Uh, after they finished, it seems that the others could hear what was going on. Peter, you're still going to be an apostle. You are still useful in my kingdom in spite of that denial. Does Jesus bring that charcoal fire to cook the fish on to be deliberately reminiscent of that night when Peter warmed himself by the charcoal fire at the high priest's house just before he denied Jesus? Did those words that Peter had spoken haunt him? Even though all are made to stumble, uh, I will never, even to death, I will never be made to stumble, even if these others do. Matthew 26, verse 33. Jesus comes to restore by probing that self-confidence that Peter had. Do you love me more than these? Now, there's various theories as to what the more than these could mean. Does he mean the fish that they've bought? Does he love Jesus more than he loves the disciples? But I think the most probable answer is that Jesus is saying, do you love me more than these other disciples love me? That was your claim, Peter. Is that still true? Can you still say that your love is stronger, your devotion is stronger? All had stumbled. But surely Peter's was the most public, the most dishonouring. And Jesus probes Peter's self-confidence and his love so that he might publicly be restored. So yes, these were awkward questions for Peter. Questions that Peter perhaps would rather not have faced. But he repeats them. Jesus repeats them. I don't think we can be dogmatic about the different words that are used here for love and sheep and lambs and knowledge and all these different things throughout the Gospel of John. He, he uses words interchangeably. So the idea of agape and filio, the two words used here for love, are used widely throughout the Gospel. So I don't think we can be dogmatic to say that Jesus is making a particular point through the language. I think the main thing is that Peter denied Jesus three times. And now Jesus restores Peter those three times by drawing forth from him that confession of, of love. However weak Peter felt, yet he still spoke. Yes, you know that I love you. Jesus is not desiring that Peter should somehow be squirming, feeling awkward in shame, but rather restoring him in, in grace, commissioning him to feed the sheep, no longer the sort of indiscriminate handling of fishermen, but the tender individualised care that a shepherd has for the sheep. A relationship there. The chief shepherd ministering to his sheep through the likes of Peter and the other apostles. Caring for the vulnerable and the needy in a, a flock that is so precious. And Peter's own valuable lessons from his experience would would be proved so useful in that ministry. So this threefold restoring to relationship is also that recommissioning of Peter. Yes, you are weak, but that's no block to you being useful in the kingdom. What matters is your devotion to me. You're not disqualified, but you'll learn much about the strength and sustainability of your own love and faith as you depend upon me more and more. Maybe there are times when Jesus is probing your faith, your devotion, perhaps through a word, perhaps through the example of someone else, perhaps through a challenge, an exhortation that somebody else brings. It can make, make us feel uncomfortable and inadequate. But if we avoid those probing questions because they just feel too difficult, we feel too ashamed, we're going to miss out on many of the blessings that the Lord would have for us 
and for others through our restoration. We don't want to hide away in shame. Jesus wants to bring us out and make great use of us in all of our weakness. That we prove time and again that his grace is sufficient for us, for his power is made perfect in weakness. And as is so often the way Jesus accompanies those probing questions with thirdly, his promises. Verses 18 to 22. It's easy, isn't it, to get caught up with the content of the promise, this prediction that Peter would be crucified, that he would face martyrdom. Caught up with that, that we miss the purpose that Jesus is actually affirming that Peter would be faithful to the end, even to death. He's haunted at the moment by that memory of not even being willing to stand up before a little servant girl and admit that he was a follower of Jesus. So what hope was there for the future? His own self-confidence had been exposed as so weak, so false. But Jesus says, I say assuredly, most assuredly, when you are old, this will happen. He will be kept. His faith will endure to the end. He will learn what it is to submit to the Father's will, even in the face of death. He would glorify Jesus through his own death for the sake of Christ. And the history books suggest that Peter did indeed die, probably did indeed die, probably some 30 years later. So he had this death sentence hanging over him, perhaps for 30 years, but under the hands of the Roman Emperor Nero, he was put to death. But for now, Peter doesn't seem quite ready to receive that as he deflects attention to John. What about him? As he points to John, who's following on behind. But the Lord graciously fixes the spotlight on Peter. Basically says, it's, it's none of your business what happens to him. What matters is my promise that you will endure even though people will take you down a path that you do not want to go down. Even in the face of martyrdom, you will be faithful. Well, we might want to leave ourselves a bit of wriggle room in such circumstances. Uh, we might want to point out what others are doing. We like to compare it to others. When Jesus is bringing his probing questions to us, we make excuses, we put off responding to the Lord. And we simply delay the speed with which we are restored to the Lord's fellowship and service when we hold back. Let's learn from this passage to heed the promises and, and believe them uh, so that we may be useful in the work of the kingdom and not skulking in the shadow. Sometimes the Lord would box us in so that we would indeed heed his promises, believe them, give us nowhere else to turn, perhaps because of uh, our health or other trials and afflictions uh, through bereavement perhaps the Lord would take away things that we're relying upon so that we might rely upon him completely and his precious promises so often pride would keep us from relying on him and he cuts away that pride and teaches us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God knowing that he will exalt us in due time. Peter had learned that lesson and near the end of his life, he wrote that we find that in his first letter, chapter five and verse six. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And then goes on to say, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Peter had proved the truth of that promise. He cares for you. He cares for me. And those he's now tending, those parts of the flock of Jesus that he's writing to with great concern for their lives. He says, Jesus will care for you too. So if you've known a time of failure and weakness, something that you're ashamed about, either in serving Jesus Christ as a professing Christian or just in your life generally, perhaps you don't know the joy of the forgiveness of your sins through faith in Jesus Christ. And that shame and guilt can keep you back from coming and wholeheartedly committing your life to Jesus. Will we hear this passage and see that Jesus delights to lovingly restore? 
and that would overpower that gnawing shame and guilt and pride that would keep us from being restored. Jesus says, come and receive my rich provision. Come respond to the probing questions that he would ask, wanting to get to the truth of the matter, get to the heart. Deal with the source of the guilt and the shame and overcome it through our own words or through the promises that he then brings to us so that we may be effective in, in helping others. Effective to tend the sheep that he brings into our care. Listening to his promises. Yes, there'll be many things that would make us fear in this life. And sometimes it's the promises themselves that would make us fear. Did Peter reflect on this promise and fear what would happen, but be comforted at the same time, knowing that he would endure to the end? Maybe there's those times we want to divert attention and just be left alone. But we need Jesus to bring our attention to his promises so that we may live with confidence with purpose being useful in his service not just wasting our time jesus knows that we will have many events and circumstances that give us cause for shame in the future but he wants us to know that he will still love us he will still call us to his service he still expects us and knows how weak we are, but how through that weakness, his strength will be made so powerfully obvious. Peter wrote near the end of his life in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, he wrote of the exceedingly great and precious promises that God has given us, and that through these we may become partakers of the divine nature. Peter had become convinced here on the beach and right through to the end of his life that there was power in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, power in the resurrected Christ to accomplish such an awesome transformation that weak, shameful, sinful people like Peter, like me, like you, can become a partaker of the divine nature. Through faith in Christ, that's what we are, partakers. That's the new normal if you've come to faith in Christ. There's no going back to your old normal, your old way of life, your old thought patterns, your old priorities, your old guilt and shame. The new normal is serving Jesus in resurrected life, accomplishing awesome things in his name with his authority, taking hold of his promises. There's, there's no way we can try and turn away for a time, but he will bring us back in. He delights in us. We are his children. We are his family. We are precious to him. He will not allow us to turn away once and for all. But if you've not yet fully trusted in Christ, you're missing out on a, a joyful, life-transforming hope. You're missing out on a new normal that is to be Welcome for being so exciting, not grudgingly gone along with, uh, with sad memories of what went before. Let's never stop hearing that call then, whether we've been a follower of Jesus for many years or just coming to discover the truth about Jesus. Hear his call, follow me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the abundance of life that there is in Jesus. He is the saviour who paid the penalty for our sin, who rose again to defeat death and sin forever, and who calls those who follow him into the service of a great king, a king of love and of power. What a privilege. May we never lose sight of that. And though we may have in sight our own unworthiness, things that would make us full of shame. May we bring these to Jesus, not hiding away, not too proud to admit it, but come and have his restoring, whatever that may be. Speak your word in, into the lives of each who listens to your word in this way, that we would be open to receive from Jesus 
that rich provision. Yes, that careful probing of his, of our faith and of our failures. But those precious promises that would bring us forward and restore us once again. Teach us from your word and bring honour to the name of our glorious Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.